stand and join me in the call to worship? When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had been were locked for fear, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Generous God, we rejoice in the gifts of grace and faithfulness you offer us. As we look at all the ways that good news comes to us, we give you thanks. As we worship together this day, bless us and remind us that your loving presence is among us. Amen. Today we have, today we have the joy of having the privilege of proclaiming our faith from the creed written by our confirmation class. We believe in God, who is our Father and Maker of heaven and earth. God created and will continue to create everything for a purpose. We believe in Jesus, God's only Son, born of the Virgin Mary. He was human and still lives among us. He died for our sins, rose from the dead, and He will come again. We believe that the Holy Spirit flows through and within us, empowering us to be better Christians. We believe the Holy Trinity is always with us, 
guides us toward being a good Christian. Amen. The peace of God be with you. Celebrate this day by welcoming one another and introducing yourself to those you don't know. Go ahead. First scripture reading today in the Old Testament comes from Psalms chapter 22 verses 25 through 31. In the full assembly I will praise you for what you have done. In the presence of those who worship you I will offer the sacrifices I promised. The poor will eat as much as they want. Those who come to the Lord will praise him. May they prosper forever. All nations will remember the Lord. From every part of the world, they will turn to him. All races will worship him. The Lord is king, and he rules the nations. All proud men will bow down to him. All mortal men will bow down before him. Future generations will serve him. Men will speak of the Lord to the coming generation. People not yet born will be told, the Lord saved his people. And from 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God. Whoever loves 
is a child of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And God showed his love for us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. This is what love is. It is not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. Dear friends, if this is how God loved us, then we should love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in union with us, and his love is made perfect in us. We are sure that we live in union with God, and he lives in union with us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and tell others that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone declares that Jesus is the Son of God, he lives in union with God, and God lives in union with him. And we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in union with God, and God lives in union with him. Love is made perfect in us in order that we may have the courage on judgment day, and we will have it because our life in this world is the same as Christ's. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. So then, love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid because fear has to do with punishment. We love because God first loved us. If someone says he loves God but hates his brother, he is a liar, for he cannot love God whom he has not seen if he does not love his brother whom he has seen. The command that Christ has given us is this, whoever loves God must love his brother also. In the children's scripture, there she is. Today's Bible verse is from Psalms chapter 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The gospel for the day is taken from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. And Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. Hear what he has to say. Jesus said, I am the real vine, and my father is the gardener. He breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and he prunes every branch that does bear fruit, so that it will be clean and bear more fruit. You have been made clean already by the teaching I have given you. Remain united to me, and I will remain united to you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It can do so only if it remains in the vine. In the same way, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever remains in me, and I in him, will bear much fruit. For you can do nothing without me. Whoever does not remain in me is thrown out like a branch and dries up. And such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire where they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish and you will have it. My Father's glory is shown by your bearing much fruit. And in this way, you become my disciples. I love you just as the Father loves me. Remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in your love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. These are the words of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Thanks be to God.
could we? Yeah. Yeah. Got everybody here? In his hands? Got everybody here? Okay. Good morning. It's nice to see all of you. Isn't it so nice to have pleasant weather and we can wear sandals and things like that and go outside and play and do all those kinds of neat things? Isn't that cool? Yep. Yeah, you got sandals on. I can see them over here. Yeah. Yeah, you know, God loves all of us. That's part of what the song is saying. Got the whole world in his hands. Can you imagine how big God's hands must be? the whole world in his hands and takes care of us loves us how wonderful that is God makes all the trees to grow and all the gardens to bring forth the fruit and the vegetables and all those things that we need and the trees wow God's got the whole world in his hands and what that means is that God's watching over you and watching over me and helping us to live life in a way that makes us happier, healthier, more loving, and more caring. And so God enfolds us in God's love. We live in God's love every day. You have somebody who loves you. Doesn't have to be a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And I know some of you, boyfriends or girlfriends are like, <laughs> you know. But you got God who loves you every day of your life. God cares about you, whatever you face, whatever your struggle might be. If things even seem pretty bad sometimes, you got to remember, God loves you. That's very important because it's true. It's very true. And God holds you in God's hands because God cares about you and wants you to be happy and to be healthy and to love. So remember that, okay? When we sing songs like that, you're one of God's people, you're one of God's children, and God loves you so much. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for our children. We thank you for the love that you share with them and for the love that we feel from them. Help us to give our love in a way that allows them to grow strong and allows them to grow great in the faith and allows them to feel the presence of your spirit all the days of their lives. We pray for each of our children that they might do well in their lives, be happy and faithful and faithful Christians. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We invite to come forward those who wish to affirm their baptism by being confirmed. I invite to come and join me up front here, Claire Kaywood, Courtney Nuss, Howie Spencer, Charlie Walter, and J.C. McGee. Okay, you all find this inside your bulletin. It's a service that we're going to do now, a liturgy. And you can follow along with me, and at times you join in with me as well. Friends in Christ, we all are received into the church through the sacrament of baptism. These people have found nurture and support in the midst of the family of Christ, and through prayer and study, They've been led by the Holy Spirit to affirm their baptism and to claim in our presence a covenantal relationship with Christ and the members of this church. They are here for service in Jesus Christ using the gifts which the Holy Spirit bestows. I have questions for the candidates. But first, let us pray. Oh God, we are grateful for your love. We are grateful for these children of ours 
who have come and studied and are now part of your church through this confirmation today. They lift up you as their God. They lift up your son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior. Be with them now in this time and in this place. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are citizens, equal citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus alone being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in Christ, in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. I want to ask you these questions, and we ask this of everybody who becomes a part of this church. Do you desire to affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I do. Do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, say, I do. Do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, say, I do. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, and to show love and justice? and to witness to the work and the word of Jesus Christ as best you are able. If so, say, I promise with the help of God. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow in the Christian faith, to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all the world? If so, say, I promise with the help of God. Let us unite with the Church in all times and places in confessing our faith in the triune God, this is a time for you to be reminded of your confirmation, of your baptism. And so, people of faith, I ask you, do you believe in God? If so, say, I believe in God. I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? If so, say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? If so, say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Just you and I are going to pray this prayer together. The prayer for the candidates. Join me. O oh God, my God, known to me in Jesus Christ, I give myself to you as your own to love and serve you faithfully all the days of our life. Let us pray in silence. Let us pray together. Almighty God, who in baptism received these your servants into the church, forgave their sins and promised them eternal life, increase in them the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Grant love for others, joy in serving you, peace in disagreement, patience in suffering, kindness toward all people, goodness in evil times, faithfulness in temptation, gentleness in the face of opposition, self-control in all things, thereby strengthen them for their ministry in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. When I call out each name, I invite family members, as many as of you, of you as want to come, to come up and join us around your, your child, your grandchild, your niece, your nephew, whatever they are to you. I invite you to come and join us. Claire Kaywood. Claire, come on up. And those the rest of you, you can touch, touch Darren and Renee and go on. All of you are part of this with me, okay? Claire, the God of mercies multiply grace and peace in you. 
enable you truly and faithfully to keep your vows, defend you in every time of danger, preserve you to the end, and finally bring you to rest with all the saints in glory everlasting. Amen. Claire's Bible verses, Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Go now and serve the Lord. J.C. McGee. J.C., the God of mercies multiply grace and peace in you, enable you truly and faithfully to keep your vows, defend you in every time of danger, preserve you to the end, and finally bring you to rest with all the saints in glory everlasting. Amen. J.C.'s verses from Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Courtney Nuss. Courtney, the God of mercies, multiply grace and peace in you, enable you truly and faithfully to keep your vows, defend you in every time of danger, preserve you to the end, and finally bring you to the rest with all the saints in glory everlasting. Amen. Courtney's verse is from Revelation 3.11. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Go now and serve the Lord. Howard, Howard, Howie, <laughs> Spencer. Sorry, pal. <laughs> Now we may the God of mercies multiply grace and peace in you, enable you truly and faithfully to keep your vows, defend you in every time of danger, preserve you to the end, and finally bring you to rest with all the saints in glory. Amen. How we chose John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And now and serve the Lord. Tear jerker. Charles, Charlie, Walter. He's almost as tall as me, squatted. <laughs> He's taller than me when he stands. Good grief. Charlie, the God of mercies, multiply grace and peace in you, enable you truly and faithfully to keep your vows, defend you in every time of danger, preserve you to the end, 
and finally bring you to rest with all the saints in glory everlasting. Amen. Charlie chose John 14, 6. I am the way, Jesus said, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Go now and serve the Lord. Now please pray with me. We rejoice, O merciful God, with these people in the gift of the Holy Spirit and in the Spirit's power to awaken us to new truth and to inspire us to venture into fullness of life. We give you thanks that they have been moved to affirm their baptism. Help them to live not for themselves, but for Christ and those whom Christ loves. Keep them steady and abounding in hope, never giving up, pressing toward the goal of life with you in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. By your baptism, you were made one with us in the body of Christ, the church, and today we rejoice in your pilgrimage of faith, which has brought you to this time and place. And we celebrate your presence in the household of faith. I ask you, do you promise to participate in the life and the mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in worship of God and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves this community and the world? If so, say, I promise with the help of God. I'm going to ask Ron Ketchum to join me up front. Ron is the president of the congregation, and we're going to extend to you the right hand of Christian fellowship. While he comes, let us welcome, let us the members of St. Paul's United Church of Christ express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ. We promise you our continuing friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and the labors of the Church of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. May we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love and be witnesses of our risen Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of St. Paul's United Church of Christ, we extend to you the right hand of Christian fellowship and we welcome you into the church as a full member of the congregation. This means you're grown up now. You didn't graduate, that means you're more responsible. And Amy is giving each one of them a Bible from the church with their name inscribed on the outside of it. And before we're through here, let's express joy. There's two reasons to express joy. One is that she's alive. <laughs> and the other is that she just loves teaching these kids every year. So celebrate that too. <laughs> Go now and serve the Lord. I think Amy and I are just getting older. We cry a lot. Because <laughs> we are happy for the children. This is a great church. You all know that. And the size of the numbers of people who come forward has just convinced me of my theory that this church is just one, is just ten great big families. <laughs> In any other town, you'd be a little church. <laughs> just... I hope what I have to say to you today will help you in your faith and help you to grow and be stronger in it. I love the taste of Concord grapes. Maybe some of you do too. I like them right off the vine. They taste so sweet and so good, but of course for a diabetic that's not a good thing. But I love the way they taste. Two houses north of my home in Michigan, there grows a vine that someone planted many, many, many decades ago. It's an old one. And that vine produces the best tasting 
Concord grapes that you might find anywhere. And it's because the soil in that area of Michigan is good for vineyards and that kind of thing and growing grapes. The previous owner of the property loved to share the grapes with all of his neighbors. And so if we were there when the grapes were at their best, we always enjoyed the sweet, luscious treat that they provided, that they offered to us on many pleasant evenings when we'd sit out by the lake and around a big old campfire and have those grapes and other treats and that kind of thing with us. That good neighbor passed away. New people bought his home from his heirs, and though they're very amicable people, they clearly do not want to share the grapes. Okay, they own them. We'll deal with it. Jesus compares our community of faith to a grapevine with its many branches. In that comparison, he names himself as the vine, and he calls his disciples, that includes you, and that includes me, he calls us the branches, and then maintaining the vine and its branches, in Jesus' analogy, finally, is God. God the Father who trims and prunes us so that good fruit is produced from out of our labors and from out of our pursuits. Speaking to, his, to this comparison, one writes and said, it is the vine that draws the, the uh, I can't read my writing, oh yeah, the sap. The vine that draws the sap from the kindly earth. He then goes on to say that it is the vine that passes it to the needy branches, enabling them to hold on. The sustenance we receive then, therefore, is Jesus. Through Jesus, our vine is not just to keep us alive, not just to keep us in the faith, but to keep us stronger in that faith, to keep us growing in that faith, to keep us maturing in that faith, even if, if, if from confirmation on, even from baptism on, our sustenance comes through the vine, Jesus. And as with the grapevine, it is intended to enrich each of us in such a way that we are able to live fruitful and productive lives. The Bible teaches then that there are three results produced from this inward union we have with the Savior. The first result is that of effectual prayer. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. Well, that's a really powerful statement. I never got the bicycle I asked for. That never happened. What did he mean by that? In other words, as it says also in the Bible, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. What does that mean? Well, this claim doesn't apply, however, to just anything. And in some ways, it just doesn't apply to anybody. It applies to those who have consciously decided to draw their life support from God through Jesus Christ. And when Jesus said that those who pray will get what they ask for, he knew that those who were being nourished through his word and nourished through his teachings were not going to be people with outrageous requests. So when Ed Bray asked for that bicycle, that wasn't what it was about. He knew that the people who were attached to the vine, they would be people of faith who were seeking God's will in their lives. That yielding to God's will in itself becomes a prayer, prayed daily, not for things, not for wealth, not for fame, but for spiritual strength, for spiritual direction in our lives so that we grow in the faith, so that we become more empowered to be the people that God has intended every single one of us to become. It is the one who prays that kind of spiritually based prayer whose prayers are what has an effect and whose prayers are answered. If you are a branch attached to the vine, your prayers are important. In our union with Christ as our vine and we ourselves as his branches, the second result we can note is how our lives begin to glorify God in our character and in our service. Jesus said, by this, 
my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. The Christian faith is all about character. The Christian faith is all about service above self. That's the real reason for it. Worshiping God, glorifying God with our character and with the way that we serve. Not too many people in our culture get that these days. Not too many get that. Churches thrive that stress everything God can do for you and how God can make life easier for you and how things can be better for you. Those churches thrive when they talk about what God can do for me, that person we call me. Where character and service is mainly stressed, though, I have noticed, the pews are more than likely to be less full. And what the Bible teaches is about character and service, not about what is it that God's going to do for me tomorrow, or what is the little gift that God's going to leave for me under the tree, because I'm such a good Christian. Not about that at all. That is a myth. Where character and service is stressed is in the churches that are being faithful to God's call. It's easier to live by a gospel message that simply teaches Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. It's easy to live by that kind of thing because that's what everybody wants. Much more easier than by the gospel that says and by the gospel that teaches, yes, Jesus loves me, therefore I have these responsibilities to his call that I must fulfill. And he has no responsibility to me. He's already filled his responsibility. We must live the faith in both word and deed, which is not always popular, particularly in a very wealthy culture like ours. You know, if you make over $70,000 a year in your family, you are in the top 1% of the world. 99% of the rest of the world wishes they had what you have. Americans, that's how wealthy you are. We must live the faith in both word and deed, which is not always popular. St. Paul addressed this in his letter to the Roman church, saying, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Character is defined as qualities of honesty, fortitude, integrity. And these qualities develop as life develops with its many temptations and its many detours. And those of you who are along with me in this age group now that I'm in, you know, those folks who are moving forward on into their older years, you know what I'm talking about. Life is full of temptations. Life is full of detours that we could take. And some of us have made those choices that we sure wish we had not when we were younger. And we sure wish our confirmants won't when they get older. But the qualities of honesty, integrity, fortitude, those qualities develop as life grows on and you grow and you learn and you mature. And when one has withstood the test and has withstood the temptations and has withstood the frustrations, then he or she knows it's not all about me, but more so about how might I serve God well in this life, in this world, because God knows you've only got so much time. You cannot buy any more of it. It's non-renewable. It's not like you can grow more trees, you know. It's not like you can make more food or you can grow more corn or you can grow more wheat and all that kind of stuff. When your time's gone, it's gone. That's all you got. You only get so much. Those of you who are young, yes, you feel like you've got forever. And those of you who are older know exactly what I'm talking about. And you have to decide, what are you going to do with these very precious moments, these days? And you can't go back and change what you've done. And you, you have a future, but today is the moment in which you live, and you've got to do something with that, and you've got to do it right, right now. Because you may not have a second chance. So we learn 
that life is not all about me, but it's more so about how might I serve God well in this life. In our union with Christ as the vine and ourselves the branches, a final notable result is we become recipients of the joy that flows from Christ into our souls. Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That's what he said the day he was talking about being the vine. I'm saying these things that my joy might be in you and your joy might be made full. The earliest disciples surely needed Jesus. They needed Jesus' joy in their lives, given all that they suffered for the faith. Even today, Christianity is being severely challenged around the world. You know that because you hear it on the TV set. As I said to you in the newsletter article I wrote, that if any of you have read it yet, one man, Reverend Reese, says there's more Christian persecution now than there was in the Roman Empire. We're challenged. The joy of Jesus is throughout the New Testament writings. As one commenting on Jesus' words wrote, moreover, suffering for the sake of Christ is a, is a sharing in the suffering of Christ, which will eventuate in joy when he is exalted in glory. When we're gathered around the throne, we're going to be joyful because Jesus has been exalted in glory, because we have found the heavenly realm where God is, because our souls are living eternally. There's a new day coming. And Jesus once said, So, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. On that day, whatever this earth throws at us, on that day, our joy will be made complete. So if you are like a grape branch, if you are drawing your strength from your vine, and if that's Jesus the Savior, and if you're seeking God's trimming and pruning in your life as you grow so that you become stronger in the faith, then, one, your prayers will be effective and God will answer them. And two, your life will glorify God through your character and your service. And three, you will feel the joy of the Lord in your soul no matter what. No matter what you face, no matter what comes your way, no matter, no matter what despairing or this awful thing could be. There must be something to this trimming and pruning. Even when meant in a spiritual sense. The grapes at the lake. The grapes at the lake, for instance, aren't looking good these days. They look a little wild. The family that bought the place they aren't trimming and pruning too much. Just letting them grow. They're looking, beginning to look, the, the vines are looking overextended. The grapes don't look as plush and as juicy as they used to look. I doubt the grapes are as good as they used to be. Maybe they've grown sour. I hope so. I love the people. They just won't share their grapes. <laughs> the new owner needs to be more attentive, though. He needs to do some pruning and some trimming. Thankfully, that is not how God is with you or with me. Thankfully, God truly loves all who abide in his love and want us to thrive and makes him or herself subject to God's trimming and pruning. The new owner up there needs to be more attentive. The new owner up there knows what he's doing. God truly loves all who abide in his love. Jesus is divine. We are the branches. God is our keeper, tenderly caring for us all. What more could you want? Oh, dear God, we have often turned our backs on you in our lives and not always been the people we should be. And so today we pray that you'd be with each one of us in this room and help us to grow in the faith.
and become stronger in the faith. We pray for your blessings all around you, us, all around us. We pray for your love to be working through us. And we pray for new life in your son, Jesus Christ. Bless this church, bless this town, bless this nation, bless all who are in them. May we see the truth of our many, many blessings and the call to share those blessings with others who are in need. Help us to be people of faith, true faith, that honors you and blesses your name so that we, like the branches in a wonderful vine, might thrive and grow and be the people of God that we should be and prosper in the faith that we have and be close to you, our creator God, forever. Amen. We pray this now in the name of the one who sought us for his own and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God blesses you whether you even recognize it or not. You probably overlooked a whole lot of things God blesses you with. I do. And when I catch myself, I'm really sorry about it. But that's because God loves us. And it's out of love that God gave you all that you have, gave you the opportunities to make choices in your life, and made you someone whose life could be whole and well if you choose for it to be. So we can only give back to God what we're able to give. But what we're able to give is what God receives and blesses and says, this I will use in some way. So give your time, give your talent, give your treasures. Be faithful to your God and God will always be faithful to you, no doubt.
God, thank you that we are able to give, that we are able to share what we have to do your work in the world. Bless the gifts that have been brought to this place today. May they glorify only you. May they make a difference in the world. Bless the time and the talent that we also bring with these gifts and treasures. May that time and talent that we give to this church, to the work of this church, to your work out in the world, make a joyful noise in all kinds of places. Because we have given ourselves, our time, our talent to you. Oh God, bless these gifts. Bless the hands of prepared and brought them to this place. And receive them now, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. When we gather around the table, it's a very special time. It's a very special time because Jesus Christ started this. This was his thing. He did this himself. And that's why we keep doing it. Like your great-grandmas and great-grandpas did it, and your great-great-great-grandmas and grandpas did that, you know. Mine did. And you will... And you'll remember when you were here this day long from now. And you'll remember, hopefully, this guy in 50 years or 60 years from now, you'll be thinking about it. When you open the time capsule. Yeah, and you're only 64 like I am right now. In 50 years, our time capsule that we're going to put in in October will be opened. Be here. Remember what I said. Because you're the church. You see, this church wouldn't be here if our grandmas and grandpas didn't care about us and hadn't been part of this gathering around the table. And when we're gone, if you don't do this, nobody will. That's how important this is. That's how important confirmation is. You know, it's quite often we have young people who just kind of go away they figure they graduated from church don't do that to us we've all worked too hard too long to keep this faith alive to keep this church here so that you could come here with your families this is where you come to worship don't let it die only you can take care of that 50 years from now because the rest of us won't be here Majority of us. Some of us are younger. <laughs> so remember what I said. Long after this voice is silent, we give it to you. Just as Christ gave it to us through our mothers and fathers, our grandmas and grandpas. And so when we gather around this table, we remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, that he spoke to his disciples and he said, Take, eat. This is my body. He didn't say sliced up for you. He didn't say killed for you. He said broken. Broken for you. And it was in the same way that he also took the cup and he said to his disciples, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for the remission of the sins of the many. All of you drink from it and do this to remember me. That's why we drink this, to remember him. Must be Concord grapes. And it's good to drink of this. Will you all pray with me? Oh, blessed God, today we come before you with this meal that your son prepared for us. And we remember him through it. We remember what he said to his disciples that night. We remember that, remember that his body was broken for us. We remember that his blood was poured out for us. And so we gather around this table just like our moms and dads did before us and our grandmas and grandpas, the apostles, the prophets, the martyrs, 
who lost their lives, the martyrs who are losing their lives today and can't be around a table like this today because they have been killed for their faith. Those in Africa and those in the Middle East and those who are in, in the region of Pakistan even now. We take this communion because they can't anymore. But then they're with you. So are our grandmas and grandpas and great-grandmas and grandpas before us. And so God help us to be people who remember who we are and to whom it is that we belong. Help us to remember that not only are we offering this bread and this cup, but we are offering ourselves. Bless us now as we enter into this time of communion together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You need to know that every person is welcome at this table. You don't have to be a member of this church. We don't require that. We believe that all Christians are welcome. And so you are welcome. You don't have to be a member here. I say that again. For behold how good it is that brothers and sisters dwell in unity. So I welcome you to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west and dwell with me around this table and find peace in Christ. Come now, my friends, for all things are ready. As you pass this bread to one another, please remember that Christ said, this is my body broken for you. Although you can say, Christ said, this is my body broken. Or Christ said, this is my body that I have broken for you. For my, you know what I'm saying. Good. Remember that. Go ahead. Get wrapped up in my words.
they each took the bread and they did eat. As you receive the cup, remind yourself Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. And they each took the cup and they drank from it. It is recorded that as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ is alive. And Christ will come again. They sang a hymn and they left that place. Join with me now as we sing our final hymn. Here I am, Lord. 
find pretty good things. Our young people are gathered in the, the separation area back there behind the doors to receive your adulation and congratulations and all that and uh, to say whatever you have to say to them. You are the people of God and God blesses you daily. God walks with you all the time and you may not even be aware of it. But go out into the world and recognize the truth and the truth is that Christ has died that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. And whatever it is that we face in each day of the world, in the work day, in the school day, whatever it is we face, those are minor. They really are. 
you have God on your side. You have God working for you and with you. And our Lord calls us out into the world to make a difference and to be the people that God has met each one of us to be. Each one of us has a calling. That is the truth. So go and serve the Lord. Go and serve the Lord with your life, with your love, with your compassion, and with your hope and your dreams. And God will be faithful to you. God will make his face to shine on you. And God will grant you peace. Amen.